Well, Happy New Year's Eve. Thank you. <laughs> Awkward. Oh, goodness. Well, I have a late Christmas gift for y'all. Y'all like Christmas gifts? Does everybody want a Christmas gift? I have a short sermon this morning. Um, now, when a preacher says that, they can usually go 45, 55 minutes or, or longer. Hopefully, we won't do that this morning uh, because this really is a, um, it, it was a, a one-point message. And this one point, I struggle because I, I want to give you more than one point. Um, but this one point is pretty simple. It's pretty powerful. And if you'll just grab it, engage in it, and embrace it in this next year, I can promise you this. Your life will be changed and transformed dramatically uh, as you engage in that. Now, um, as you can tell, I am not uh, Pastor Jeremy. Um, uh, Jeremy and the girls are down in Florida uh, enjoying the holidays with Pam's family, and they're having a great time. So uh, keep them in your prayers as they're there, and that they get back this week uh, safely. Uh, but this morning, I have the pleasure of bringing God's Word to you. And uh, for those of you I may not have met yet, uh, my name is Andy Gowns. I'm one of the pastors here as well. If you have your Bibles, I'm going to encourage you to tr turn to John, the Gospel of John. We're going to be in chapter 1 this morning, so turn to John chapter 1. But in John chapter 20, the Apostle makes a claim that's pretty amazing. He says, I have written all these things, I have collected all of these things in this letter, so that you might know Him, speaking about Jesus, and believe in Him, and therefore, that you might have a life that is completely different than anything you've ever experienced before. That's why I, John, have put together this letter so that you would have evidence and proof that Jesus is who he says he is. Uh, about 12 years ago, um, I had the, uh, the opportunity to write a book uh, for my son. And um, in that book, there was a chapter and, one of the, and, and, and the premise of this chapter was simply this. How do you define success? How, how are you going to define success as you're growing up, as you're maturing, as you're becoming a man? Because, see, a lot of us, when we think about success, we think about success as being part of our job. Uh, a bigger office, a bigger paycheck, a bigger title. We think about bigger houses. We think about bigger um, cars, nicer cars. We think about, um, uh, I almost made a mistake last, uh, last sermon uh, saying bigger wives. Uh, I was thinking about my wife being taller, not bigger necessarily. Uh, that would be success. Um, uh, um, but, uh, but the thing about it is we have these preconceived notions of what success looks like. And we're chasing after them but we really are never happy when we achieve them. A bigger office, a bigger paycheck, nicer car, nicer house, better relationships. If your happiness is found in those things, you'll be happy for a fleeting moment, and then you're going to be chasing after the next relationship, the next house, the next car. You will never be satisfied if your value, your self-worth, your identity is found in stuff. This morning, we're going to take a look at a, a, a passage of Scripture. And i got to tell you, I'm, I'm, we're just going to read it here in a few moments. I'm going to walk, or walk, walk our way through it, work our way through the narrative. It's, a, it's an amazing story. I mean, it really is truly an amazing story. And there's only one real point to take out of this thing. The one question that Jesus asked of these two, two, two guys that are following after him. And we're going to get there in a moment. But right now, let me pray for us. Um, and let's get ready to enter into God's Word. Father God, thank you for this day. Thank you for this moment. Lord, I pray right now, I submit myself to you. Lord, help my thoughts to get unjumbled. Help my, my, my words to be your words. Lord, help my intentions to be your intentions as you want to share this message this morning with your people. And God, help us to have ears to hear and hearts to respond. In the name of Jesus, amen. So if you have your Bibles there, we're going to be in John chapter 1. We're going to start with verse 35. You can follow on the screen or follow on your Bible. It says, again the next day, John was standing with two of his disciples. This is John the Baptist. John the Baptist was standing with two of his disciples, and he looked at Jesus as he walked by, and he said, behold, the Lamb of God. Now the two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. And Jesus turned and saw them following and said to them, here it is, here's that question, what do you seek? What you looking for? And they said to him, Rabbi, which translated means teacher, where are you staying? 
And he said to them, come and you will see. So they came and saw where he was staying and they stayed with him that day for it was about the 10th hour. Now one of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He found first his own brother Simon and said to him, we have found the Messiah, which translated means Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. He, Andrew brought uh, Peter to Jesus. And Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, the son of John, and you shall be called Cephas, which is translated Peter. <coughs> Excuse me. Imagine the narrative as it's being played out. John the Baptist, he's been on the scene down at the Jordan River teaching and proclaiming uh, the coming of the Messiah, the appointed one, the promised one, the one we've been waiting for for centuries, the one promised to Abraham, he's coming. We got to get ready for him. We need to have repentant hearts. We need to, we need to face the, our sin and our problems and our issues, and we need to get ready. And this is the message that John has been teaching and preaching. That's why he's baptizing. He's not baptizing them into the faith. He's baptizing the people into uh, repentance. And he's got his own disciples who are following him. And one day, he's out there, and Jesus comes walking by. Now John, under the power of the Spirit, knows who he is. And he says, Behold, the Lamb of God, Jesus. And these two guys that are standing next to him, these two disciples, they overhear him. And they just simply leave John to go follow Jesus. Anybody ever met a famous person? Did you, did you walk right up to him and introduce yourself? No. Um, I was blessed to work with a pastor down in Tennessee uh, um, at my previous church. And he never met a stranger. Matter of fact, if he saw somebody, he would, he would dart across the room to meet them. Uh, that's not my personality. Uh, I kind of hang out in the background, and I, I want to meet them, but I just kind of, I, I kind of keep edging in and edging in and edging in, hoping they'll, they'll notice me. They never do. Uh, kind of hard to imagine, but uh, they ignore me. But not Kevin. Kevin will walk right up. Hey, I'm Kevin Trum. And I, mean, I, just, and I loved hanging out with Kevin because, well, you'd meet everybody with Kevin. I mean, I've met, I've met lots of people um, with Kevin, uh, and, and, and it's just exciting when you get to be there. But most of us, don't have that boldness. Most of us, when we see somebody we want to be around, we, 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 we try to ease our way into their presence. That's what these two guys were doing, these two disciples. They're Andrew and John, by the way. John, who wrote the Gospel of John, and Andrew, who, um, the brother of Simon Peter. And they're just kind of walking along behind Jesus, kind of following him. Jesus knows they're there, and he turns around and he asks the question, what are you seeking? What are you looking for? And this morning, that's the question I'm asking you. What are you looking for? You see, a lot of us go looking for all sorts of things. Jesus made the comment somewhere in, in the gospel. He said, seek and you will find. Now, he was talking about the kingdom. If you seek the kingdom, you will find it. But I promise you this. If you're looking for something, you'll probably find what you're looking for. It may not be what you thought it was. Remember that conversation about success? When you go chasing after the other things, you'll probably find them. But it might not be what you thought it was going to be. It might not pan out to be as all glorious as you hoped it would, would be. And the question we need to be asking ourselves is, what are we seeking? What are we looking for? Why are we coming into God's presence? I mean, you're here this morning, so I'm assuming that uh, you're looking for a better relationship with God, a more mature relationship. I, I'm going to make some assumptions here, and it's always wrong to make assumptions. It's going to be dangerous. But, I mean, it's... 11 degrees outside, uh, and you all made it here. Uh, so I'm assuming you're looking for something. What are you looking for in this relationship with Christ? What are your expectations? What do you desire? And that's a great question to ask as we get ready to enter into a new year. Uh, a lot of us will make resolutions or goals, however you want to call them. We'll have things we have in mind. Last year, I set a goal to lose 300 pounds. I did. Both my kids went off to college. Uh, uh, but uh, no, just kidding. Uh, <laughs> see, be careful what you set your goals for. You have to be very definite. Uh, but the thing about it is, you know, we'll, we'll all set goals this year. And if we don't have the right goals, you're not going to end up in the right place. One of those goals as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ should be for us to grow in our relationship with him. One of those goals and those desires should be for us to, to, to deepen our relationship with Him. 
And we're going to look at this passage here a little bit deeper here in just a few moments, and we're going to see how that kind of progresses even here in this first chapter of John. We see a deepening of understanding in our relationship with Christ. But what are you seeking? Well, I love the answer that the two give him. Because it should have, I mean, this, is such a, this is such a Jesus conversation. Uh, have you ever noticed when Jesus says something, it never seems to quite line up with the thing that we're looking for? It's, the conversation is all over the board. Their response, Andrew and John's response is, is all, all over the board too. What are you seeking, Jesus asks, and they say, where are you staying? So were they seeking his apartment? Were they seeking his house? Well, the answer is, yes, kind of they were. You see, that response uh, is, is kind of formulaic uh, in the sense that it, it shows that they were wanting to go to his, his home and spend time with him. They wanted to enter into a, a more deeper private relationship with him. It was them kind of asking permission to quit following John the Baptist and start following Jesus. And Jesus says, come and you will see. That's, I, I can't even begin to communicate really the emotion that should be welling up inside you right now as you just think about those, those little conversations there. What are you seeking? Where are you staying? Come, and you will see. They went, the Bible says they went, it's about the 10th hour, 10th hour is right at dusk. They got there, they went in, they stayed the night with him. The implication is they stayed all night. And I have no idea what they talked about, we have no record of it, but it must have been pretty amazing. Because when the morning comes, Andrew leaves to go find his brother, Simon. And he says to Simon, I have found the Messiah. I have found the promised one. Whatever Jesus shared with him that night was enough to affirm to, to Andrew that this was the guy we've been waiting for. This is the promised one. And not only have I met him, come on, you got to go meet him. He takes him, and he takes him into Jesus' presence. And we have a life transformational moment. It's so transforming that it changes uh, uh, Peter's, uh, uh, Simon's name. Uh, Jesus says, from now on, you're going to be called Cephas, or uh, Simon Peter. And that's how we kind of know him. Uh, more, more either Peter or Simon Peter than we know him as, as Simon. And that wasn't the only place that Andrew begin to transform him. Uh, there's records uh, throughout the rest of the gospel. Andrew's also the one that brought the little boy with the loaves and the fishes uh, when there was 5,000 people to feed. Uh, Andrew's also the one that brought uh, the Greek Jews into Jesus' presence on, during the Passion Week. Andrew was always bringing people into Jesus' presence because whatever happened on that night changed him forever. What are you seeking? You see, that's the question we need to be asking ourselves this morning, tomorrow morning, Tuesday morning. What is it you're looking for? You know, a lot of people come looking for a relationship with Christ so they can get something out of it. Now, for those of us who've been in church for a long time, that's almost a foreign thought because we got all the church language and the church, church uh, mentality. We, we don't think that way. But a lot of folks come to Jesus so they can be fixed. They got an issue. And if I just had a little bit of Jesus in my life, it'd be, I'd be good. And once they come and once they get that, we might not see them ever again. Some people come to Jesus to be around them so that they can uh, um, just enjoy the experience. Um, I don't know whether you know it or not. Now, we have a really good Jesus experience here. But you can have other good experiences elsewhere. And the experience isn't about all of this. The experience is about how it makes you feel. One of the things I hated to hear the most when I was preaching uh, years ago at Barnett's Creek, um, um, not just Barnett's Creek, any place I preached. Uh, y'all don't do it here, so thank y'all. Uh, but uh, um, after the sermon, we had to go back to the back, and it's kind of the receiving line where you stood there and you shook hands as everybody walked out, and everybody felt like they had to tell you how good you did. Uh, um, I only had one person tell me how bad I did uh, once. Uh, God bless him. Uh, but, but they'd walk by, and they'd be shaking your hands. But I had one guy every week t tell me the same thing. A preacher? You stepped on my toes this week. Thank you. What? I don't want to step on your toes. I don't want to rough you up. I don't want to make you feel bad. I want you 
to hear the gospel and have a life transformational moment. So whatever it was that I stepped on your toes about, it's different next week. Quit doing that stuff. But see, but some of us like to come in and be told how bad we've been and how good Jesus is so we can feel good about ourselves again. Some of us just enjoy the experience of it's going to sound terrible, but ex- Jesus is a drug of choice. Their life is, is messed up. They can come in here for an hour, hour and a half. They get their Jesus fix. And they feel better about themselves, and they go back out in the world. But nothing's changed on Monday mornings. Nothing's changed on Tuesday nights. They're still doing the same old things. You see, that's not what living a life for Christ is about. It's about being transformed and changed in such a way that the things you used to do are no longer there. Now, that's not to say they don't have some, uh, some chains on you. They don't have dragging at you from time to time and, and, and kind of getting you all messed up. But it's to say this, that in Christ you have victory over them so that you don't have to be a slave to those things any longer. That's what we're talking about. What is it you're seeking? They spent the night with them. They had this wonderful experience with them. And the thing they were looking for more than anything was just time to hang out with Jesus. That was really the whole point. This is a really simple sermon, folks. What is it that you're seeking? Are, are you seeking an experience? Are you seeking a fix? Are you seeking uh, uh, um, some, some answer to all of life's questions? Or are you just wanting to hang out with Jesus? See, most of us are so busy doing church and doing religion that we forgot the most important part of our faith, and that's just hanging out with Jesus. What would your life look like? What would your life look like if you spent it just hanging out with Jesus instead of doing all the busy stuff? How does that impact your hobbies? How does it impact your family time? How does it impact your work? How does it impact even your church involvement? I'm not, oppo- Listen, I'm not opposed to being involved in church. We need, to, we need to be involved in church. But if the only thing that you're doing it for is because it's something on the checklist to get checked off, then you've missed the whole point of being a believer. I, I know this from conversations that me and Jeremy have, have had. What we desire more than anything is for us as a church to get to a point where we're living life together in Christ. And then church and activities and worship, they become, they become things we sprinkle into our existence. They become the flavor of who we are instead of the identity of who we are. We want you all and we want us to be living in such a way that it's just Jesus all the time. Just hanging out having a good time, being serious, but at the same time, enjoying this life together. Some interesting little tidbits real fast here. Let me kind of run through this. Uh, that as you are growing in this relationship, as you're being transformed, uh, the, this passage here gives us some hints about that, that journey, if you will. Uh, verse 38, uh, they call him, and these, these, are, these are all uh, c- c- kind of put together with how they identified who Jesus was. In verse 38, he's identified as their teacher. See, most of us, when we came to know Christ, that's the very first place we encountered him. He was our teacher, our rabbi. He, he gave us the do's and the don'ts. And we begin to learn them. But the funny thing about it is, uh, with teachers, um, you can be taught by a good teacher. doesn't mean that you're necessarily learning. Uh, you have to place yourself under submission to that teaching in order to embrace it and to grow with it. So there may be some of us here this morning that, that you're just at the beginning stage of your journey. He's just a teacher. You're learning the, the, the ropes, so to speak, of our faith. But you haven't quite put them all into action yet. Well, the next place we get to, uh, down in verse 40, 41, is he's identified as the Messiah, the Christ, the, the, the promised one, the, the fulfillment of God's word. See, in that relationship with Christ, He's become more than teacher. He's become our hope. He's become the thing that we're latching on to, the promised one. At that point, you're beginning to probably have more of your life under his control, but you're still struggling. 
Because when we have hope, it's because there's things in our life that distract us from hope. There's things that we need hope from. And we didn't hit the verse, but down in verse of, of 49, uh, there in chapter 1, verse 49, there's, there's, let me read it for you real fast. It says, Nathaniel answered him, uh, another one of his uh, disciples, Rabbi, you are the Son of God, you are the King of Israel. Once you've encountered Jesus as your teacher, once you've encountered him as the promise, the final stage is to experience him as Lord, Son of God. That means you've given everything over to him. Now, don't raise hands and don't have no confessions. But is every area of your life submitted to him? I mean, every relationship you have has been submitted to him. Every penny you earn has been submitted to him. Every moment of time has been submitted to him. Every one of your toys has been submitted to him. I mean, I've shared with y'all before, I'm pretty good with the money part. I'm pretty good with my time part. The place I fall apart at is my toys. I like my stuff. I'm stingy. I have a hard time sharing my stuff with Jesus. I have a hard time sharing my toys. It's a place where I struggle at a lot. The good news is I don't have very many toys. Um, maybe if I wasn't so stingy, the Lord would let me have more. You know, but the thing about it is, is that have you submitted your life fully to Him as Lord? What are you seeking? Well, like I said, if whatever you're looking for, you probably will find. Here's some things I want to encourage you to look for. Uh, kind of an action plan for 2018, if you will. I want you to go home this afternoon, and I want you to get a piece of paper, and I want you to put it on the top of that piece of paper, that question, what are you seeking? And I want you to really place it under God's direction. And I want you to write down, what are some of the things that you are, you are seeking this year? What are some things that you desire in your relationship with God? Here's some suggestions. Get connected to the community. That's us. If you're, not, if you're not hanging out with us, you're missing a huge part of your Christian existence. We were not designed to do this alone. We were designed to do this together. I cannot function to my full capacity if you're not here engaged in my life. When I say here, I don't mean actually here, here. I just mean in my life altogether. You can't get done what you need to get done if you're not engaging other believers in that community. Commit to read your Bible this year. I have been doing that now for 13 years. And I will tell you, it's one of the hardest things to do. I did not finish this year. I got about three-fourths of the way through, and then I got busy doing church. I got busy doing good stuff, and I forgot to read. And then it became two days, then a week. Then I thought I'd get caught up. I'm telling you, the enemy does a lot to keep us all discombobulated. Being busy doing good stuff, but not doing the right stuff. How are you going to spend time with Jesus? How are you going to hang out with Jesus if you're not hanging out in his word? That's where you find him at. Commit to reading the Bible this year. Matter of fact, we're doing something different with our, our Bible reading plan this year. It's, it's listed in the bulletin each week as well as online. Uh, this year, we're not reading through the Bible. We're just reading through the New Testament. Uh, so I would encourage you to start tomorrow. Uh, there should be something in your bulletin this week or online. Uh, but we're just going to start reading through the New Testament and hopefully uh, get through those 22 books by the end of the year. Uh, and uh, it will be, I promise you, it will be life-changing if you'll, if you'll commit to do that. Find a place to serve. You were designed. God made you and shaped you to serve. Maybe the reason why your life hasn't been the full experience that you thought it might be is maybe because you haven't been plugged in to serving in the way that God wants you to serve. Now the neat thing is, we have places for you to serve here, but you can serve elsewhere as well. The Lord doesn't demand that you serve here at this church. He just wants you using your gift, serving his kingdom someplace. Now, the, again, the neat thing is we have plenty of opportunities for you to do that right here. But you need to be serving. And last but not least on this short list of things to think about, invest in your marriage. Now, for those of you who aren't married, go get married. No, uh, <laughs> invest in other relationships. But I just want to, I, I want to, can we get honest for a moment? Let's be yes. Let's be no, I don't be honest. 
I'm going to be honest with y'all. Will you, will you honestly hear this? We have hurting families and hurting marriages in this church and in this community. I hope that you're praying for each other. Even, even if you don't know the families and the names, just to be lifting up prayers for the families of this church. When our enemy can destroy our families, he'll destroy this church. But when we have families that are sold out for Christ, who are seeking him, who are just wanting to hang out with him, we're going to have a strong church. We're going to have a church that we don't have to go out and have um, big billboards and signs and hand out Bible tracts. I'm going to tell you what, when, when you're a healthy church, people just want to come here. We won't be able to keep them away. And it's not about getting people here. It's about us growing. See, again, that's a whole misconception in church life. We get so busy being focused on trying to get them that we forget that Jesus never went and got anybody. Jesus is walking down the road. Hey, there goes Jesus. Uh, hey, you want to go follow him? Uh, sure. Jesus, can we hang out with you? Come on. You see, when you just start hanging out with Jesus, your life will get transformed and changed, and people will notice it, and you won't be able to help what happens around you. We try so hard to make things happen without doing the first thing first. That's just hanging out with Jesus. So, those are some things you can do. But I would encourage you, invest in your marriage this year. Invest in your relationships. Make it the most important priority. Guys, are you doing everything you can to help your, your wife to become everything that God desires for her to be? Ladies, are you helping your husbands to become all that God desires for them to be? Are you working together to provide a stable environment for your kids and your children or grandkids? It's a huge picture. But I'm going to tell you what, when it's, when it's firing all cylinders, it is unbelievable. So what are you seeking? It's interesting. Anytime someone comes seeking Jesus, Jesus never turns them away. You cannot go through the gospel and find any place where someone came to find Jesus and Jesus said, no, I'm not, I'm too busy. Come back tomorrow. Jesus normally drops everything he's doing and says, hey, let's go to your house. Or, hey, let's go have dinner. Or, hey, let's go do this. Sometimes he even stops on the side of a road, gets off the crowd, walks over to the sycamore tree, and pulls the little guy down. You see, for those who honestly and earnestly want to find Jesus, Jesus will find you. He turns no one away. This morning, I don't know where you are at in your life journey. Okay? You might, you might be here for the very first time. This might be one of the first times you ever heard the gospel presented. And here's, here's, here's what the gospel is. What are you seeking? Are you seeking Jesus? Are you seeking salvation? Are you seeking, do you have a need? And if the answer is yes, and most of us do, amen. Let me introduce you to Jesus. Come, see where he's at. Come follow him. It's real simple. God made everything and it was good. We came along and messed it up. We've been trying to fix it ever since. We can't fix it, folks. Only God can fix it. And he did through his son, Jesus. So if you know that you are broken and you are in need of being fixed, I'm talking about spiritually fixed. I'm talking about if you know for a fact that today if you were to die, that you'd go to hell. Don't stay in your seat. Please come see me. If not this morning, this week. And let's talk about it. But for the rest of us, for those of us who are believers, for those of us who have taken care of that initial step, the question for you this morning is, what are you seeking? Are you needing a deeper relationship with Christ? Are you just wanting to spend some more time with Him? Are you needing to work on your marriage, on serving, on your commitments? Whatever it is you need to do, here in a moment, we're going to give you an opportunity to pray about that and to do that. You can come up front and pray. You can stay in your seats and pray. But I would encourage you, no matter what you do or where you do it at, that you make some type of response this morning. As we get ready to start 2018, the question is really simple. What are you looking for? And I promise you this. If you're looking for Jesus, you're going to find him. And if you're looking for him to, to have a transformational moment to change your life like you've never experienced it before, you won't be surprised. He will deliver. 
if you'll submit yourself to him. Let me pray for us. Father God, thank you for this day. Thank you for this opportunity to stand here and to preach this word. And Lord, thank you that you are a God who asks us that tough question. What are you looking for? I love it even more that you just invite us to come, to come and to hang out with you. God, help us, help me to have that desire more. Lord, to set aside my books and to set aside my, 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 my hobbies and my the things that distract me, just to spend time with you. Whether it be in your word, or whether it be with your people, or whether it be in serving. Lord, even with my family, as we seek to discover you, Lord, just help me desire more time with you. Lord, I pray that for us as a church. Help us to be a church that desires to spend time just chasing after you, enjoying the journey. And Lord, let that be our witness in this community, a joyful community of faith. Lord, thank you again. Let me just ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.